forgive just as Christ has forgiven you. That's the motive behind forgiveness. That's the motivation. That That is the reason why we forgive. Then there's the not forgetting part where it's I'm moving forward. I'm no longer allowing that to hinder me from my future trading in my injury for purpose. So what is the deal with this perspective of forgiveness being a process? And, and I think it can also tie into in the aspect of forgiving someone who hurt you, the idea that healing is not linear, which we all agree is it has has very, very profound truth to it. When we're speaking about this from the lens of an atonement that covers the multitude of sins and Jesus being such an example and presence that we ought to follow, what are your thoughts on the idea that forgiveness takes is forgiveness is a process that can intertwine with healing not being linear? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Let me I'm gonna try to answer it. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. gonna try to answer it as I can. <laughs> yeah. I had to work myself up to forgiveness and I still have to practice forgiveness on a regular basis every day. I still have to practice forgiving people. I still have to practice this ideal grape of not holding on to things. And I have to practice that every day. Like I, I, like I have to practice that. I have to deal with that every day. I have to deal with the fact that I think that I have a right to hold things over people's mm -hmm. heart. And, and, and so it takes me back to Paul's request for his thorn to be removed. I, I don't know that God necessarily completely removes it from us as much as we choose it. So I think that the process is, is I have two choices every day and I get to choose one. I get to choose one and my feelings won't go away, but my feelings can be totally more submitted. Ultimately, the more, the more, the more I'm in God's face, the more I read God's word, the more of God's word I know, the more uh, uh, so easy it is for me to turn to God and to then engage God's word, God's promises, God's truth, God's plans and purposes for my life than it is for me to engage in my own thoughts and my own opinion is to go back. Because when I want to do something, I hear those things come from uh, 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 the scripture. This is Paul. He says to us in Romans 7, right? Or I find the law or when I want to do good, Romans 7, 21 through 25, when I want to do God, that good, evil is always present with me. For I delight in the law of God after my inward man, but I see another law in my members. Watch this, warring against what? Uh, the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members, then he, then he, look, he looks and says, this, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. So then with my mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Listen to Paul's very profound words in here. Paul saying to us, he gives us a glimpse into this daily battle of choosing. Paul says, when I want to do good, there's always an evil option. And it's like, pss, pss. you can go ahead and do that, man, because you'd be justified, right? <laughs> He's like, but I delight in doing God's law. He's like, but there's this thing in me, in my flesh, that says, no, go ahead and slap the taste out of their mouth because mm. of what said to you, right? <laughs> then he says this, he says, I live in a body of death. Can I tell y'all something? This body is not redeemed. So it has old habits, old nature, old appetites, and wants to make old decisions. So he says, who shall deliver me? Notice, he didn't say from this mind. He said, who shall deliver me from this body? So he's constantly in a battle with his body until he yields regularly to God. He says, because with my mind, I'm serving God. My will, in other words, I'm serving God. It's me getting this body to line up. He says, but with the flesh, right, I serve sin. So really, the process is a decision. Great. It's a decision. I choose God over my flesh. It's not until we're free from it do we actually conquer it completely. But mm. we can conquer or, or, or it's temptation to continue to come to us, but we can always still 
move in this place though, okay, of yielding to the Holy Spirit, letting the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us in this place. So again, I hear people, I call them escape, escape Christians. They're always like, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus. This earth is full of sin and this that another. Now, let me tell you something. Why are we asking Jesus to come and everybody ain't saved yet? Mm. And God hasn't had the opportunity to reach as many people as he wants to reach. We, we have this escapism mentality or we want to get out of stuff, but really God can take us through stuff. How do I know that? Psalm 23, David told us, yay, though I walk, see, we see so many passages of scripture like this. Yay, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. Think about everything he's saying for in the presence of my enemies, right? David is saying, I walk through this valley and you're with me. It's a choice. I either get to rejoice in God or I get to decide that I'm going to fall prey to the sin that people have done to me. Yeah. So I think the process is a maturity and a decision. It's maturity and a decision to follow what God has said and learn to put your flesh Make your flesh be subdued and committed to the work of the Holy Spirit. A part of the maturity is facing that that fleshly mind and going back and forth. A knowing part of that it's going to come up, it's going to no, yeah, knowing it's going to come up and knowing that it's going, you're going to have to fight. Like that's that's a part of the maturity is recognizing. I'm really going to have to yield. Oh, you're going to have to make that decision all the time. I'm yeah, going to have to yeah. yield, right? I'm really. Yeah. The, 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 Part of our salvation is receiving what God has done. Most of us try to perfect it when all God told us to do was receive it. Mm -hmm. I can't perfect my salvation. Yeah. I can mature in it by receiving the extent of what God did. Because the question becomes is what did God do in atonement? What are the, what are the nuances? What are the things he changed? What, what's different in the extent of atonement? And you just got to step into it. You have to step into it. Most people don't have a relationship with God. They have a relationship with religion or church. And so when you talk to them about these things, they struggle with them because they come out of forms of godliness, but deny the power. The power, mm -hmm. the power comes through obedience, not through quotes. There's a lot of Christians who can quote scripture, but aren't obedient to it. Power is in obedience, not in quotes. Yeah. And so a part of that. So, so, so really, <laughs> so, so if you notice throughout the old Testament as well, you go back to Isaiah 40, everybody loves Isaiah 40, this healing process, this restoration process, obedience is headship yielding to the right person yielding to the right power yielding to the right place so i'm yielding to god who is the greatest power and the place i'm yielding towards him in isn't from a place of well i got it so i'm good i'm yielding to him in a place where it's darkest where you I'm don't yielding you don't have the I, control i don't have where i don't have the control check out isaiah 40 comfort my people that's how he, that's how he opens up chapter 40 now Chapter one through 39, it's a lot of darkness and judgment, dryness. Uh, it, it's a lot of wasteland and things going to waste. But you come to chapter 40, he says, comfort my people, speak tenderly, he says in verse two. So, 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 and then verse three, there's a voice. So wait, <laughs> I wish I could go through the whole chapter. I love it. So there's a, there's a, there's a speaking happening, tenderness happening. There, there's a comforting happening. Then there's hard truths because he then he then turns around and says, you are like grass that withers away. So you are like grass and the wind blows and you blow away. So he so there's an acknowledgement that you're weak. I'm not in control here and I can't do anything about it. I've lost that privilege. Matter of fact, it's my self. It's it's. It's my controlling manufacturing that has actually brought me here. 
because I tried to control. I tried to put myself in the seat, the throne, and it didn't make sense. So then as we continue going, he then begins to say, I put the hills on scale or on balances and weighed mountains on scales. Who has counseled me? He goes on to say, so, so God is the great counselor. He is greater than hills and mountains. He, he is the greatest deity, entity, everything. He's, he's, he's it. Greater than everything you've turned to, to give your ear to in this space that you're needing healing. So it only makes sense that he then comes around. Watch this, this, this right here. Healing. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 through 31. Everybody loves it. Everybody loves it. They that wait on the Lord shall renew. Right? We love it. We love it. Catch this. This is where healing becomes. Uh, this is where obedience takes headship in healing. It's not to say that you won't have moments where you're tempted to set back. Let's just get even more specific. It's not that you're healing from your relationships or from the traumatic experiences or from the things that you find yourself breaking away from. It's not to say that you won't have moments of weakness where you're like, I want to go back because it's what I'm used to. You're, it's not that you won't have moments where it's like, man, I'm kind of remembering and rem reminiscing on all the stuff that we did, and all the things that we had. And man, I want to send them a message right quick. <laughs> it's not to say that you won't have those moments. That's a part of the yielding because I'm recognizing that that's, that's a moment I can very well have. So in the part of the process and maturity, the growth that's taking place, I'm continuing to stay here because I know the capacity I have to turn around and go back. Here's where the obedience comes into play because you're always moving in this healing process. Listen to this. They that wait on the Lord, keep that in perspective. We're waiting. Waiting and we're moving. How are we moving? They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. So then there's a season where it seems as if things are kind of picking up pace and moving quickly. There's a season where I'm kind of getting, I'm, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. I'm getting it. Things are moving a little fast. They shall run and not get weary. Here it is. So now I'm going from flying to running. Now I'm grounded. Okay. So I have a different season. There's potential waves of seasons in this healing where I'm getting some things pretty quickly. Now I'm on the ground. I still got a little bit of pace in me. Right. So I'm still kind of getting some things, but I'm on foot. Right. I'm, I'm moving. I got my heart rate up. It's, it's at a comfortable pace. Then there's some days where he says, then they run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. There's stages to this. But he began by saying they that wait on the Lord. So there's a there's a in the midst of waiting, there's movement. Some seasons, some spaces faster and slower than others. But regardless, I'm moving. The question is, where am I moving to? Yeah. And I'm moving closer to where God desires me to be, who God desires me to be at his pace. Because if I try to outrun God to where he's trying to get me to, I'm going to be right back where I was originally supposed to be, next to him. And I think that we see in multiple ways that Jesus healed people. Psalm 107 and 20 says that he sent his word and he healed him. The centurion man in Matthew, right, uh, 8, 8 comes and he says, just say the word and my servant will be healed, right? So we see that God can do this in multiple ways. We see Jesus kick everybody out of the room. We assume that they didn't have enough faith and then lays near the girl uh, 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 and, and heals her. But after he kicks everybody out of the room for basically telling them, y'all don't have enough faith to be in this healing moment, <laughs> basically, right? But I would tell you too, when we think of healing, what's what's the first dynamic of healing? So, 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 so if, what would you go to the doctor for? Because you're hurting. Mm -hmm. so first I have thing, to, there, I got to admit. The first thing you have to do is admit that it hurts. Yeah. Once you do that, then you can heal. But it's when you, when you hold that hurt and it becomes your personal vendetta 
and your personal anger, you don't even go see the doctor because you say, I'm going to prescribe my own measure of medicine for this situation. So it's not until we acknowledge that we're hurting, mm -hmm. right? That's when you go see the doctor. Then the doctor, watch this. Everybody who comes around you from that point of acknowledgement, from the doctor to the nurses, to the pharmacy, to going back home, everything's about healing what hurts. But it's not until you go see the doctor, man. And just like that, this video has come to the end. But don't worry, your boy's got more. Subscribe, like this video, share it with a friend, and definitely check out the channel to learn more about how you can build healthy, happy, whole, and biblical relationships. I'll see you over there. Peace.